Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Ian Barker, and today we are celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Today's session is every app trick in the book. Um, it's not all the tricks, because we'd be here for hours. There's a lot that you can do. But this is uh, very specifically about some tricks that um, people keep coming up with and asking about um, fairly regularly. Um, so I'm going to try and cover as many as I can. There are some really good books, and um, the blog post that goes with this particular uh, presentation will have uh, links for some of those as well. So every app trick in the book, all the things you uh, should be doing, and some uh, you didn't think you could. And what kind of things are we going to cover? Well, we're going to cover alerts and notifications. The elevation button. Uh, when someone uh, clicks on something in your app and you need to um, elevate the, the app uh, for the purposes of um, being the administrator or some other permissions, then uh, there's an elevation button. Uh, how to launch those things and also how to make them launch as an administrator if that's what you need. And uh, things like settings persistence and stuff like that, where we need to store things to not give ourselves a problem. Um, reading and writing that data safely as well. Um, user authentication, OAuth2, um, which is the basically is becoming the standard for pretty much everything. Um, you know the kind of thing, you go to log into a site or something like that and up comes a, uh, uh, an authentication. Instead of a username and password, um, you might ask for two-factor authentication and, um, and some additional information. That's all wrapped up in the whole nebulous... Um, um, uh, that's wrapped up in the whole nebulous part of security and user permissions. So we're going to talk about that. And the really exciting thing that I get to talk about today is a new component that's coming out in the future version, may even be the current version at the time that uh, you see this video, which is 11.3, um, also called Malawi. It was the name of the beta. So Rad Studio 11.3, there's a new component, and it is the tier biometric auth component. A bit of a mouthful, but basically allows your apps to um, look for fingerprints and face scans, depending on uh, what the biometric authentication is in your actual particular program. Um, but it's very new, and I've got special permission to talk about it because as I record this right now, it's all uh, secret and subject to an NDA, but uh, you'll see some information about that shortly. Checking for an internet connection, splash screens, and some other cool general um, cool bits and bobs that uh, you can put in your app. Themes and styles, detecting dark mode, checking for updates, um, in-app scripting. There's quite a few options for that now. Um, making your app only appear once with a single instance. Manipulating images. Uh, there's some very good components. So if you are going to um, take, for example, a profile picture in your app, and you want to do something with it, change the contrast or turn it into black and whites, which is kind of kind of a cool thing. They upload a color picture and then you can half tone it or uh, um, turn it into um, black and white or monochrome, whichever way you want to call it. Um, that's a part of the manipulating images and also being able to skew it around and, and things like that. If you're creating, I don't know, some kind of background for um, a document in your inside your app. Um, we're also going to talk about going to the web uh, and you know I don't know whether you're aware of this I hope you are by now because we've had quite a few uh, videos about it but you can write Delphi code and have that appear as a full web app and we're going to talk about that in this uh, in this uh, webinar and also once you're on the web of course there's a couple of other little problems one of them is the ability to have an SSL certificate and one of those um, SSL certificates, having an SSL certificate, that's quite important. Uh, you know the little padlock icon, I'm sure all of you know by now um, that you need to have your site secured so that the uh, traffic between your, your client, the browser, or however else it's being communicated, uh, and your actual app on the web is encrypted. And we're going to talk about Let's Encrypt. Uh, components and also how you can get free SSL certificates. You really never need to pay for an SSL certificate again, unless you're something like a banking app um, where there are certain levels of additional security. But if you're a common or garden general purpose app, 
then Let's Encrypt will do the job for you. And believe me, I've done it lots and lots of times. And uh, Let's Encrypt is fantastic. It's very well accepted almost everywhere, um, except in those very narrow use cases like banking. And if you're using some of the um, other components like IntraWeb, which has a specific port number and does some kind of unusual mapping, you can get your, your uh, SSL certificates. And now the later versions of IntraWeb will pick those up and, and use them so that it will automatically um, have the, the, uh, the web pages encrypted. But there are other ways of doing that. If you can't get the SSL working, um, or your app is just simply not able to support it, perhaps it's an old app that only does HTTP, um, then we can uh, use a thing called a reverse proxy. And if you don't know what reverse proxy is, we'll talk about it in a moment, but um, reverse proxy allows traffic coming in from the web browser using HTTPS, which is the default for all web browsers now, and uh, will then um, convert that traffic from HTTPS and SSL into your normal HTTP on port 80, your normal regular stuff, or it can be mapped to any other port, and uh, and that's what Ingenix can do um, for you. It's all free, and uh, why not? You know, all right, free is the best price, isn't it? So let's talk first about notifications. Well, notifications are um, those little alerts that pop up, as you can see in the top right-hand corner of the screen there. Um, I think it says, I'm a test notification, and the body of the notification um, is the, the, the wording that you can see in there. Um, there's uh, two ways that they appear in Windows 10 and Windows 11. One is that they pop up, you know, like the toast, um, as they're called on some other operating systems. Um, so it pops up and grabs hold of the person's attention there and there. But they also appear in the notification um, tray on the right hand side of uh, people's screens unless they flip things around and uh, they can be there they usually bring up some information like you've got 500 uh, emails waiting or there's 65 people that want to become your friend on facebook or something horrific like that how do we do this in delphi it's really not very difficult at all if you've not come across it before go to your palette and look at this system section and in there is a T notification center. The T notification center works with um, Windows, but it also works with iOS and Android as well. And what it will do is in the background, um, you've got this little uh, component, the T notification uh, component. And as you can see there, we, we use the notification center to create the uh, notification. And then we just present it and literally say, hi, you know, whatever I want to say, I'm a test notification. Um, on iOS, I think it's iOS, it could be Android, um, you can actually defer those notifications, get them to appear at a later time. Um, that does not do that on uh, Windows, but if you can see in the code that is um, enclosed in the if not deaf windows, and this happens to have I've taken a screenshot in um, 11.2, of Delphi, you can see that the of Rad Studio, you can see that the um, text is blanked out. That's because I'm currently uh, in this particular bit, bit of code there. I'm currently running um, in Windows mode. My my target destination is Windows. Um, so the fire date it doesn't work on Windows. You can't do a, a future um, notification. So it grays it out because 11.2 of of uh, for Rad Studio understands when a piece of code will not be executed depending on what your, your uh, project settings are and because I'm targeting um, Windows that uh, particular section of code is greyed out. It's kind of a cool feature actually because it makes it a lot easier with conditional um, statements. Conditional um, compilation is where you can have like that thing that says if def Windows, MS Windows. It can say, well, don't execute this code if it's not Windows. Don't execute this code if it's not iOS. Don't execute this code if it's, it's Android. Uh, very useful. But Notification Center works on all the platforms. Um, I'm not sure on Mac because I've not tried it. Um, but certainly iOS and Android and Windows works absolutely fine. Uh, and I believe it works on Linux as well. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but anyway, definitely iOS and Android, which are the, the major places that you use it. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, you can also um, get an icon that shows a number, you know, when you've got 75,000 
outstanding emails in your inbox you can make the icon have a badge on it and uh, that only works on iOS and Android but as you can see on the bottom arrow there it's pointing towards application icon and I set that to 23 so that would mean that my icon on my app installed on my iPhone or my Android would show 23 next to it and that's how you make the the uh, icon show pretty clever Elevation. Well, if you're going to do something um, slightly suspicious or um, need some additional security, because by default, obviously, Windows runs in um, a mode where doing anything that needs administrator permissions is restricted, then you normally have to ask for elevation. And elevation just means I know I'm a regular user, but um, I need to elevate it. I need to ask you for the admin um, username and password. Now, generally speaking, this only works on Windows and it only works uh, using the VCL for that little badge to apply um, because it is a kind of Windows function. Uh, and what it does is it shows the icon that Windows puts for the elevation. So you don't even need to worry about where you get that icon from. As soon as you click that um, checkbox there that says elevation required, it will show that button next to it. Now, let's say that um, you want to run an updater. Um, and generally speaking, your installer needs to run with some kind of additional permissions. And you know that it's going to show the, uh, are you sure you want to do this dialogue that Windows shows? This would be an appropriate use for that button. So making it uh, ask some information, ask for elevation from uh, user permissions into some other um, permissions. That's what that button's for. Um, very, fairly simple. It doesn't do anything itself. It just flags that button um, what you actually do then afterwards is to um, write the code to do the elevation. Now, you might say, well, how do I do that? Well, if you want to make your app run as administrator, so whenever it runs, it's going to ask for that, that uh, please type in your credentials um, dialog, then go to the um, project options for your project. And in the manifest, uh, click on there. And then the second thing is on execution level. And the execution level by default is what's known as as invoker. And what that means is that if you um, run your application from the Windows Explorer, that runs in normal user permissions. So it means that your app, when it runs, has got whatever the permissions are of that logged in user. Now, on a corporate network, an enterprise network, different users are going to have different rights. Usually on a normal machine, then the user has permissions to do almost everything and access pretty much any resource. So they can go to the documents folder, and if they've got any additional drives, they can access it as well. But on an enterprise network, and we're kind of focusing a little bit on enterprise, that's obviously not the case. For example, um, a regular user wouldn't necessarily be able to go and look at the uh, accounts uh, users, uh, the financial uh, director or similar kind of protected information, human resources information. They wouldn't be able to go into that folder um, because the rights are restricted. So in order for that to work, they need to be running, launching the app from an account that's got those rights or they need to ask for it. The highest available option allows you to select whatever you, your um, your highest rights are, and it may be that they um, have granted you additional permissions, but usually speaking, the other option is require administrator. If you pick require administrator, when the app runs, it's gonna say, bling, uh, project1.exe, or whatever your app is called, requires administrator rights and it will show that, that lovely uh, yellow or um, blue dialogue depending on whether you've signed your app or not and saying that this app is a known app or unknown app again if you haven't code signed your app then it's going to say it's from an unknown publisher um, go and look at my uh, my uh, blog entries on the Embarcadero blog and we'll talk about code signing in there but it will come up and show that dialogue. So that's what required administrator is used for. Use it sparingly. You don't want your apps to normally run as administrator. It's very much frowned upon. Uh, and I've got customers who would actually probably chuck your app off the uh, network if you always want administrator rights and say, why do you need to do it? Because it's a security risk. To launch or relaunch an app as an administrator using that elevation button, which is the next stage on from that, 
you um, can use the following code. So include or use the shell API. And then down there, um, as you can see this uh, little function called run as admin, you see the thing that says sei.lp verb, a long pointer to a verb. Um, and this is deliberately written so that it will work um, from Delphi 7 upwards, actually. In fact, probably earlier than that. But um, the only bit that won't work on the older Delphi's is where it says if not parameters dot is empty, because that's a later um, string helper uh, function. But uh, if you um, include run as, that's code for you are to run as an administrator. And uh, you can uh, check through this and there are actually lots of other verbs that you can use so if you just want to launch something um, using the default application let's say a, a text document you might have associated in Windows a text document with notepad or you might have um, associated it with uh, ultra edit which is an idea of product or you might have associated it with notepad plus plus or you might even have associated it with um, uh, Visual Studio Code or something uh, like that. Um, if you use the verb open, then what it will do is actually launch whatever that um, document is with the application that's associated with it. So all you would do is say run as admin or run as uh, whatever you want and, uh, and give the document name rather than application name. So if I had a, a text file called mytextfile.txt, uh, in the file name, I would put my text file.txt in a full path to it. And in the verb, I would change that to say open. And that will automatically get Windows to launch it with Ultra Edit or Notepad++ or Notepad. Uh, uh, the built in Notepad. As you can see, there are other functions as well, like print if you want to print the, the document using whatever the default um, print mechanism is for those documents. Um, then you can do it. You can display the object's properties that will get the explorer to open it up and show you what the properties are and a few other things as well. Um, simple trick, but weirdly enough, some people don't do it for some reason. Um, shell execute is not the thing to use um, normally, but in this particular instance, if you want to use the verb, then you need to do that. Okay, so the other thing, which is kind of wrapped up with permissions, is where do I store my stuff? Well, if you are writing enterprise apps, you may find that you can't always use the registry. There are parts of the registry which are always open, um, but depending on the way that uh, network admins have set it up, and actually I find that a lot of network admins get it wrong, um, you may find that you can't actually write to bits of the registry you should be able to. And so the registry can be a bit of a problem. Likewise, um, actually, if you go cross-platform, that can also be even more of a problem because uh, there is no registry <laughs> on, on iOS and Android. It just doesn't exist. And so saving uh, to the registry is just not going to work full stop. And yet a lot of apps try and do that. They persist certain settings in registries. That's great if it's Windows and it's a normal um, end user c consumer account it's going to be fine but in corporate environments not going to work um, now you, that leaves you a couple of options uh, option one is to um, say well we won't we, we just won't do it you know we will not store it uh, in the registry at all option two is uh, you know and therefore not persist option two is to say we will persist it we'll, we'll store it in a file now it could be in any file which actually is fairly convenient more and more now people are using um, JSON uh, files so they've got a config file which is JSON um, or it could just be you know you can store them in a, um, a SQLite file or something like that but either way wherever you're going to store them you need to know where to store store those um, though you know persist those settings if it's going to be in a file where it's going to be safe and actually with the um, tpath option um, there are lots of methods that will return paths that are safe get documents path returns the path to the directory where the user documents are stored so uh, seek on a backslash users backslash your username backslash documents um, is one option better on iOS and Android it will actually um, resolve to something better or something different should I say um, 
same with get library path that's uh, makes it fairly clear there what it does you can store any data your application needs to store and uh, regardless of the user so in other words um, this is uh, a shared place if it's per user that's not where you want to store it and get shared documents path and get shared downloads path again if the setting file or the data or the most recently open project or whatever it is you're trying to store in in these persistent things you don't want to be doing it in the shared documents folder because every user will be able to see that and what you don't want on a machine where more than one person logs in and that happens on enterprise um, systems particularly if they're uh, hot desking you know this computer is for everybody's use and different people log in with their, their login and get to it what you don't want is uh, John Smith logging in and getting all of his files and then he goes away and then uh, Sarah Johnson comes in and she logs in and she sees all John Smith's settings because you've stored everything in the get the shared documents bar so there is uh, an art to it and it's about making that you sure that you're using tpath and get the per user settings it might be that for some settings you you do want them to be shared in which case you might have two settings files one for the shared and one for the uh per user settings that's up to you it just depends on your architecture but tpath is the way to do it and uh, it's the only safe way that works on windows it works on mac it works on ios works on android so uh, go off and do that user authentication big subject now big big topic passwords uh really are becoming a problem and uh, certainly phishing attempts with a ph are very common and if you are providing access to personal data um, in europe and certain parts of the us not quite so much in texas where i live but certainly <laughs> many parts of the us um, protecting personal data is actually uh, a legal requirement and significant requirement and in doing that in protecting that information you need to make sure that um, you're providing a mechanism that that is hard to get into it's no good if they just need to know the username it's no good if the password doesn't have any um, form of uh, complication uh, detection in it but of course the number one uh, favorite way of doing this now is to use OAuth OAuth 2 and OAuth 2 is a standard it's uh, there's a proper RFC um, is it RFC yeah, yeah. yeah. Re request for comments but it, it's a it's an established standard it's not just one company like Microsoft or Facebook doing it it's it's plenty of companies and in principle it's, it's fairly easy to use what happens is your app goes off and says ah to the user uh, dear user we need you to log in and sometimes it gives you the opportunity to log in with uh, Google or log in with Facebook or something like that but either way at the other end of whatever resource it is so accounts data or personnel data or um, even just you know projects or documents or something like that it will come back and say okay um, you've provided the username and password and we know you know that now but the next step is uh, making sure that um, it is really you so we will use a secondary type of information to um, validate who the user is and that is one of these famous uh, verification codes so it could be a six digit passcode you're all familiar with it I'm sure if you've, you've you're using good practices then you should already be using uh, um, what's known as secondary authentication in principle it's easy um it's just sending tokens backwards and forwards but in practice it's actually pretty hard to do uh and in fact it's a bit of a nightmare to get right okay now the built-in rest components um in the later versions of delphi 11.2 in particular has got this um they actually include OAuth oauth2 authenticators so if you've got a um, a rest component there that you're using you can uh, authenticate in that and as it says here it's a, a client authenticator um, but you can see the caveat at the bottom of that thing it says it offers minimal support and provides the infrastructure to follow the workflow of the service provider so if you're getting someone to log in using gmail then uh, or google should i say then uh, in theory this can work 
Um, it could be some other system, you know, they've got a REST interface, an API, and uh, part of accessing that API, your customer, your user, your client needs to authenticate with two-factor authentication. I've tried it. I actually found it quite tricky, um, but it does work. And, you know, there are better programs than me out there, and I'm sure they'll be able to uh, work it out fairly easily and go, ah, it's not difficult at all. My preferred option is to get someone else to do the hard work. Um, that's the whole point of Delphi, is components. <clears throat> and I have found that um, TMS software, they've got a product called Sphinx, and that allows you to implement OAuth 2. They provide, unusually compared to other options, because there are some other people out there, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but they provide a server and a client side. So if you're writing your own um, server out in the network somewhere out on the internet and your customers have an app that you've written or a desktop app or even a web app or an iOS app and they connect to that server to get whatever information it is um, uh, I don't know information on on uh, fruit flies one of our articles recently was about that um, you can implement uh, two-factor authentication so that only the people that really really um, are allowed to access that can do that on um, just by dropping that server component on your server app. The client side of it is the login, the Sphinx login, and there's also web login as well, so it works with their, their um, uh, web uh, applications. What that does is shows a web page, so you, it opens a browser and you go in and, and do it that way. The login part of it is just uh, a normal regular dialogue and there's an interaction that goes on there. Um, it's asynchronous because that's just the way that these things work. Another component that does OAuth 2 is from ECGC, um, who have the craziest company name, but they do do very good <laughs> components. I always stumble over their uh, particular um, company name. Uh, they've got clients and server components. Um, there are different prices, and to get this server component, um, you need the enterprise level. With TMS, they have an all-access subscription and if you get the all-access subscription or the biz uh, subscription, I think there's another option, um, then you'll get all of it. You get the server and the client. But with ECGC, um, SCGC, uh, you need to go for the enterprise level. That, at least that's what it looked like to me. I looked at their uh, um, pages. I've not used these components. I have used some of their components in the past. Um, for WebSockets, but I've not actually used the OAuth components. But the WebSocket component is great. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, go to that page and have a look and see if it's the thing for you. And uh, whilst we're on the subject of authentication, let's talk about a new component coming up in 11.3 Malawi. Uh, Malawi um, is the next version of Rad Studio 11. Uh, it's been a public beta, so there are people out there that have tried it out who aren't Embarcadero uh, MVPs and M Embarcadero employees. Um, but just as a caveat, because I have to say this legally, this is an 11.3 Malawi beta feature. It's covered with express permission from Embarcadero. They told me I was allowed to talk about it. Um, but I do have to say as a safe harbor statement that unreleased features are not committed until the general availability of uh, Malawi. So um, just bear that in mind, take um, that as you will. So what does this biometric auth component do? Well, it's actually very cool. What it does is if you've got a, an iPhone on an Android phone, and actually some Windows do this as well, but these are the components that are very specifically for Android and iOS. And that is, as you can see there, when I point to it uh, with the red arrow like that, where the cursor would be, you can see that this particular platform um, for this component is only supported for Android and iOS. And what it does is allows you to either authenticate via fingerprint or authenticate via biometric facial recognition. It's very, very cool. And it's the missing um, link on authentication. So if you've got OAuth 2 set up um, or some other method, um, even just username and password, there is a new component to go with that. And it makes the whole biometric authentication, which is very common now. I mean, most banking apps, you've got to use your fingerprint sensor on your phone before you can get into it. And if you don't, you really should. 
Um, otherwise, if people know your password, they can log in. Um, but this component does it. Now, why do we care about biometrics? Why do we care? The thing about a biometric system, and I've got a bit of expertise on this because one of the um, first biometric uh, time attendance systems in the UK, uh, when I used to live there, was written by me. And uh, we were the first to the market. And the reason that biometrics are important is because it authenticates that you really are you. You're not someone that knows the username and password. It's your fingerprint, therefore it can only be you. Either they've chopped your finger off, obviously, <laughs> or they've uh, knocked you unconscious and stuck your, your finger on it. But that's a bit extreme if all they're trying to get to is look at your uh, database of uh, fruit flies or something like that. But in theory, biometrics are completely um, secure because it authenticates the individual. Now, for time and attendance, it's pretty handy for us because it means that when a person is clocking in or out, um, they can't just hand their phone to someone else and say, hey, my password is this. Um, can you log in and clock me in whilst I'm off down the uh, grocery store buying uh, donuts or something like that? So they're getting uh, paid for doing something they shouldn't. Likewise, it means that if your um, user has left the phone on the desk, whilst they go to the bathroom or something like that, because that's good policy to make sure that you uh, stay germ-free, it, uh, it means that one of their colleagues can't pick that phone up, uh, you know, a nefarious actor or somebody like that, and log in using the username and password. They have to use the biometrics. So it's a very, very important um, component and very useful. How does it work? It could not be simpler. Uh, you go to the additional section of the component palette, drop it on your FireMonkey form because it is cross-platform. No point in doing a VCL because that's Windows only. Drop it on your FireMonkey form. Set the prompt details. If you look towards the right there, there's a thing that says Delphi wants to know you. Uh, pre please prove who you are and prove it's really you. Those are, um, you. once you use it, you'll, you'll make it, you'll understand what I mean. And then there are just a couple of methods. It's really simplicity itself. Authenticate method, what that does is starts the process. So it launches the fingerprint uh, scanning interface on of Android or iOS, depending on uh, whatever that uh, device is that you're running on. And uh, it will then um, come back, uh, depending on what button they click. So if they actually authenticated, it's gonna come back with uh, a response, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, in that code there, I'm checking that the biometrics is available because some people will turn it off because um, with Android, uh, for example, you can say to it, no, I don't want to use biometric authentication on this particular app. I think that's a setting that I saw recently. Um, so you've got to make sure that it works. It may be they've not set biometrics up or some other reason, um, in which case you need to say, sorry, biometrics are not supported. But if it is supported, all you do is call the authenticate and up will come that dialogue. At the end of it, if you want to, you can provide a button that, that the user clicks on to cancel the biometrics so they can get out of the loop of asking for the password. When it does authenticate, there's two events. One event is authenticate fail, and it's fairly obvious what happens there. If it failed, then it comes back and says, hey, the, here's the, um, the failure um, reason. And I've put a nice little case statement there to say the fail reason is they canceled it or um, the phone uh, or mobile phone or whatever it is has come back and said hey can you use something else because my camera's broken or something like that it's unusual but it, it does sometimes say fall back to a password there's a little box that says um at most of these dialogues um, use a password instead if you click on that then it'll say can you use fall back you can then respond and say no i'm not going to let you use the username and password or you might allow it um denied in other words they they have actually been blocked um, the user has locked out the device. If you use uh, Find My iPhone or you use um, the Android facilities to do this, you can lock the phone and prevent people from getting into it. So if your app is running and it's uh, on the lock screen, um, you may um, lock the device, in which case when they go into the biometric authentication, it'll actually say, uh, -uh this user is definitely not allowed to use it. So permanently locked out of the device, that's where you actually uh, go into Find My iPhone and say, lock this device. Um, error occurred, obviously what that is, and user requested help. There's a little help button on most of these user interfaces, and uh, and you can then respond to that and say, Pick, put your finger on the device or smile sweetly at the camera. And uh, off it goes. If it works, it, it's just one event, and that is 
it's successful because you don't need to know who who stuck their face on the device all you need to know is it's an authenticated user on that mobile device and usually on the phones uh, or the tablets there's only one user and that is the user that has installed your app okay so they're an authenticated user they're recognized recognized by the operating system now if you're going to do that kind of authentication and you're given access to a resource then you may say things like okay i need to check that um, there's a database online or whatever it is you know you're giving um, access to an online device surprisingly enough this is this actually gets asked about a lot which is people say well how do i know if they're on the internet you know how do i know if they've got a wi-fi signal how do i know if they're they are um, they're not in a dead zone you know when you're driving along sometimes you get these dropouts and dead zones and, and it, I don't know why but people ask it a lot it's actually fairly straightforward all you need to do is call uh, include win inet which is in the top there and then say if internet connect connected state and uh, you don't care what the cardinal uh, or what the origin is and it's if it succeeds it's connected and if it's not succeeding then uh, it's not connected the other way to do it, or the traditional way to do it, is to try and ping Google. Uh, and because, you know, if uh, Google is down, then the apocalypse has probably begun and we're all going to go uh, and live in caves again and, uh, and eat uh, uh, healthy food for a while. Um, but that is one way of doing it, is to try and ping a well-known site. It may be that you ping your own site, um, but you do need to have availability. And what we normally do um, to do that is we use Indie, the Indie TCP, uh, Client, a TCP client which is uh, free and widely available and you go in there and you put a timeout and that's actually quite a big timeout and um, two seconds um, you might want to show it less than that but if the resource you're connecting to is fairly slow to respond and Google isn't but if it is because you're across a very slow um, connection then you, you adjust that timeout um, port 80 that's just doing a TCP a HTTP um, ping uh, to port 80 and uh, connect and disconnect if it worked then you won't get an exception if it didn't work then there's an exception saying you know you can't connect or it's prevented or whatever and uh, and you set the result accordingly um, these tips are from uh, fmx express and also dave nottage um, fmx express is um, a very good site if you've never come across it before go to it because every single tip you could ever um, want and if you're at the recent um coding boot camp i think it was um eli from fmx express i think he had something like a hundred tips or something like that. he shot through a load of them in a very short length of time um absolutely amazing it's packed with information but there's the url for it and um, these all will be in the blog post that accompanies this uh, presentation and dave nottage's delphi worlds also an excellent site if you're a delphi programmer go there dave is uh, also an mvp uh Embarcanero mvp he's based on the other side of the world for me um based in australia um but we won't hold that against him <laughs> but his uh, site is excellent he's got all the answers you can ever need and this is one of the ones uh, that i i found as i was going and looking through so now the next question is what happens let's do some uh splash screens oh look well you know a splash screen is not used very often apart from things like windows apps and mac apps especially if you're trying to connect to a slow resource but uh, they're actually very very easy to do some fairly cool little tricks with it so hopefully you can see in this uh, video that this is a form with a hole in it and not only is the form got a hole in it but the text itself where it says ha has also got a hole in it and so our very cool um uh delphi helmet background which is actually from uh, mid journey there's a site which i'll link to on the blog post as well um where these images come from um, you can see that uh, helmet showing through okay now the question is uh, it's all very cool and everything you know it works but how did I do it well all you need to do is change um, a couple of sections of the the uh, form to be transparent and I've chosen fuchsia that's because most people do not use this garish color on anything and uh, if you choose fuchsia anywhere on the form that's fuchsia as that horrible bright pink color is called um, you'll see that uh, that goes transparent 
So I need to tick on the box that says transparent color and I need to say fuchsia. Now one small tip is on the label control, turn off anti-aliasing. It's one of the properties on label control. Look down it and you'll see it. If you have anti-aliasing on, you'll get a blurry kind of um, fuchsia outline to it because the way the anti-aliasing works is it takes an average of the, the background and the foreground and then uh, draw some pixels that kind of in between those colors um, to make it look smoother. If you have that turned on on the label control, you're going to get some weird artifacts around the, the label. So turn off anti-aliasing. Uh, Turn the transparent color on and pick pick fuchsia or something like that. And then I've just got shape control there, as you can see. Um, there's a, a shape control, um, the Delphi image, which is uh, just standard uh, image on there, and then the font. I've just chosen the font face for the word ha as uh, colored in um, fuchsia. I've turned off theming. Um, because if I do that, then I would need to do some extra things with the label control as well. But uh, if you want to make parts parts of your theme transparent, your, your screen transparent, then this is the way to do it. You can't use this trick if you use the glass frame feature. Glass frame, when you turn that on, makes parts of your um, screen look like a pane of glass. And it also know what work, will not work if you use the custom title bar um, feature in um, uh, Red Studio as well. Custom title bar is where you can have a completely differently themed um, uh, title bar and you can put the caption in left or right or middle or center or whatever and uh, change the foreground and background. And so it's not using the Windows drawing of the uh, title bar, but its own uh, title bar theming. So you need those turned off because as soon as you turn those on, this transparent color option will not work because it, it messes around with that information. What other things we can do to add coolness to the apps? Well, go to the um, tinyurl.com forward slash Delphi Wow Factor. If you've not seen this uh, presentation before, there's one, another one by me called How to Add the Wow Factor to Your Apps. And that just shows an FMX app with some very cool stuff to do with Skier for Delphi in it. Um, everybody's favorite new library. And that can do things like um, animations that are timed and triggered and all sorts of exciting things like that. Definitely worth going and looking at that. And another one is uh, themes. If you're going to use themes and styles, um, then really this is probably the right thing for you to go and uh, look at. And again, it's on the main Embargadera blog, uh, tinyurl.com, Delphi W11 Design. And finally, are you handling the themes correctly? Are you making things go dark and light and all the rest of it? Um, go there. Uh, there's not a tiny URL for that one. I uh, ran out of time. But uh, this article then talks about it. All the links will be in the blog, so you'll be able to see it. That accompanies this particular presentation. And what about checking for updates? Well, if your app is running, you might want to um, check for a later version of it. There are different ways of doing that. You might just look on a particular resource and say, is there a new executable there? If there is, then I'll download it. Um, Marco's got a very, very old blog entry in 2007. That's yeah, a good few years ago uh, now. But it still is a, as relevant today as it was then. Create a file stream, get that update and pick it up. And then uh, you, you know you, the name of the update changes per executable and that's the way to do it that way i personally am too lazy to do that i mean too uh, busy to do that that's what i meant and so i actually use some components to do that there are a few out there but um the only one i found to work and i've checked several is the um t web update component from uh, tms which they sell separately but it's also part of their package and uh, holger a good friend of mine mvp holger flick has got um, a video that shows you how it works if you do look for update components, and this is the reason I mention um, this particular component set, um, watch out for the Google um, results because TMX Web Update comes up quite a lot, which is a different component. And TMX Web Update, the versions that I found actually had viruses in them. Uh, the sites had Trojans in them and I was trying to download it. I use a good uh, Trojan and antivirus protection um from malwarebytes actually as it happens and so i'm 
uh, you know, I get triggered when those things turn up. But just be really, really careful on what you look for because some of these sites are not cool. Okay. In app scripting, well, it used to be that um, you could do in app scripting with basic or you could do it with Python. It's fairly easy to do. And there are still components to do that. The best way to do it now and the most popular way is to uh, script things with Python. Python's a great language and Embarcado have embraced it as part of its stable, shall we say, of, uh, of uh, languages that we, um, how shall I put this? We support and uh, ac accommodate because we feel there's some overlap between Python and Delphi. And I say we, I mean me and a few others as well. Um, but Python for Delphi is definitely the thing for um, doing scripting now. Uh, Python's a very easy language to use, but it is a scripting language, and that's where Delphi scores. It produces proper um, full-blown uh, IXE apps, which you can read about when you go to the um, Embarcadero website. But uh, if you want to include scripting, just use the Python for Delphi uh, um, components, and it will allow you to... Uh, script things in Python which is really not very difficult if you don't want to do it that way if you like me and a bit lazy and go oh it's so complicated there are two other options um, one of them is uh, another TMS component because you know if they stop making good components I'll stop talking about them I keep saying this um, and that is the Script Studio Pro. It's got its own little IDE, which is written in Delphi, and uh, you can script things in there. They've got it's fairly powerful and got all sorts of options. And the other option is DW Script by Eric Grange. Eric's is um, open source, I believe. Yes. And as you can see on there, it tells you what it does. It allows you to script things in Pascal or um, Delphi. It's got some extensions for free, you know, that are been stolen or borrowed shall we say uh, inspired that's the word i'm looking for from free pascal and prism and a few others as well but it's a very interesting project and uh you know it's up on on um, github um freely available for you to get hold of uh, tms is obviously a um a commercial uh, uh, option single instances well if your app is running and you're doing all these things like doing updates and all the rest of it you might want to make sure that at any point your your application is only run once and the best way to do that is to um, create a thing called a mutex now the options that i've seen out there for doing single instances tended to only work for windows uh, and that's a bit of a problem now because uh, mostly we're trying to target things like Linux and Mac OS and a few others as well. Android and OS uh, kind of cope with that by relaunching the app anyway. So you never really have an issue with them running two copies of your app. It's always just that app is running or it's not. So it doesn't really crop up in there. But um, Linux and Mac and Windows does. If you're on Linux or you're on Windows, then... Um, you can use this option it's a stack overflow option and the url is there and it will be on the blog post that goes with this presentation and basically what you do is you create a mutex to a file now uh, the get attempt dir function there just happens to be you know creating something called slash temp slash or slash dmb with another slash and it's round the right way if you use path dilim then it will be backslashes for uh, windows and the other slashes for linux um, the option that uh, was shown in the Stack Overflow answer there actually used hard-coded path names. I had to laugh, um, but uh, don't don't use hard-coded um, slashes or, or anything like that. Use path to them because that will be filled with the appropriate one depending on whether you're Linux or Windows. And all it does is just create some mutex on that that file, and uh, and when you're finished at the end of it, make sure that you release it and uh, it just means that there's only one uh, uh, version of your instance running. It, it works, there can be some difficulties if your app crashes and you don't get to destroy the direct file stream then there can be a few issues as well but um, read into that, that uh, article because it tells you all about it. Manipulating images, well <laughs> it's not difficult. Our uh, Spirit of Delphi winners from last year uh, skier for Delphi as you can see from the um, little graphic there I've got showing uh, with the spinning card absolutely superb um, piece of software 
it allows you to manipulate images and do things like change the brightness and the contrast um, you can colorize it so if you wanted a, an image to be pink or green because of the status of uh, some some resource or something like that you could do it that way you can change the hue and saturation so you can change whether things are darker or lighter um, you can put vignettes around it you know that kind of cool uh, um, round or rectangular um, darkening effect um, you can do that drop shadows you can do that bang in a little uh, um, a flash very good and lighting effects so you can have the images lit in odd ways and you know, like camera flares and stuff like that and as you can see from the uh, animation there you can have some very exciting things to do with the, the rotation of images and stuff like that. very very clever um, great piece of software Jim and I, uh, Jim and Keith and I, have talked a lot about how cool Skier Fidelphia is. Use it. If you're doing Fire Monkey and you never use any of the features of, of Skier, just include the library anyway because it'll make all your Fire Monkey stuff go a lot smoother. It's, it's, a, it's like a free, injection of, a free injection of performance, shall we say. Going to the web. Well, we've talked about this to death so let's just um, talk about it one more time and that is that you can use UniGUI um, which basically takes your app and then it surfaces it on a HTML5 um, canvas so your app is still running as normal except it appears in a browser uh, so instead of being rendered to a monitor it's being rendered to the browser canvas. A slightly different um, idea there to IntraWeb what IntraWeb does is allow you to write Delphi code and then uh, your app will run and IntraWeb has got a little server that produces its own HTML um, out to your browser. And then, uh, yet again, a different nuance to it is TMS WebCore. And what WebCore does is basically takes your Delphi code, all your Delphi forms, and instead of producing a .exe, produces a bunch of HTML and CSS. So there are three options, and each one of them has got a slightly different nuance to what they do. UniGUI does one thing, and the interweb does something else, and it's very subtly different to WebCore. I'm a big fan of WebCore, but I also use interweb as well professionally um, during the day. As you know, I'm a programmer, get up every day and write code. I say this all the time, and I've used both of those. I've not used UniGUI. I have looked at it, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's an absolutely brilliant component. Uh, it just didn't have a use case for it. That's the only reason I don't use it. But I use both interweb and WebCore, and uh, they're great. And if you're going to use... If you're going to go to a web app, then the next thing you need is a real SSL certificate. SSL obviously means that that little nice um, padlock icon turns up in your your uh, web pages, um, but, but they're quite expensive. I mean, you can pay a couple of hundred dollars for a, an SSL certificate, but why pay anything at all? Go to Let's Encrypt and get free SSL certificates. Cost you absolutely nothing. And the only caveat is it does need to renew every 90 days, but it's very, very easy to set up. And go to letsencrypt.org. I am going to actually do a webinar on um, taking some existing interweb apps and um, without adding anything, making them behave um, with SSL included. Interweb and WebCore, and I think Unigoo as well. I think Unigoo actually does its own thing with let's encrypt but both of those are capable of uh, finding an ssl certificate and then serving up https automatically you'll find if your site doesn't support https then actually you'll get warnings about that site and uh, your customer's not going to trust it with good reason uh, it makes you vulnerable to things like man in the middle attacks and stuff like that if you want to make it easy then there is actually a component that will allow you to work with Let's Encrypt. It's written by uh, Embarcadero MVP Paul Toth, and uh, I've bought it myself, and it's called Delphi Acme. Acme is the Let's Encrypt protocol that does this SSL stuff. And it works great for um, Delphi, Tokyo, Rio, and Sydney. Um, I, I have no reason to think that it won't work with later versions of Delphi as well. Uh, when you, you, you can use it and test it, but eventually at some point you should buy it. If you buy it, um, it, you'll get the full source of code to it and uh, admiration for Paul Toff for making him a little bit uh, richer um, by paying for it and supporting his work, which is important. You know, let's not underestimate the value of something, If even if you're only paying 50 or $60. If it saved you a few hours' work, then it's got to be worth every penny, right? 
And if you can't use SSL, then use Nginx. So Nginx is the default um, or de facto, shall we say, web server that I use nowadays. Very easy to configure. It just uses some straightforward files. But the one good thing that it does, which is very, very simple, is that it allows you to reverse proxy traffic. So if you've got an intraweb app like that, where it's saying 127.0.0.18094, and you want to surface that out to the world because you've got a domain called your domain, domain name .com. If you can't support SSL in your app because you either don't have the source code for it or it's old or you just don't want to do the engineering to include the SSL in it, then you can use Nginx as a reverse proxy. And what it will do is it accept incoming traffic to HTTPS colon and then whatever your domain is. It will then convert that to HTTP traffic, non-SSL secured, internally in your network, communicate with your intraweb app or whatever it is, your intro about then responds using HTTP. It reaches the reverse proxy, and the reverse proxy then converts that back into a HTTPS or secured SSL traffic. Very, very cool. Very, very easy. Literally go in and just change a couple of lines in the config, and off you go. It will work. And really, the point of what I was trying to show here is there is nothing you can't do with Delphi. Nothing. And in fact, there's a, a webinar I'm going to do later where we actually pit ourselves against WPF, you know, .NET WPF and Electron um, apps to see whether what we were saying was true. Is it true that it's a good solution? The answer is yes. You want to run your app on a Raspberry Pi? There's a solution for that already, and it works today. You want to run it on a cheap Amazon Fire tablet, and they cost virtually nothing because Amazon subsidized them. But effectively, behind the scenes, it's Android. It doesn't look like it, but it is. But it'll run just fine. I have an app running behind me on an Amazon uh, Fire HD 10, I think it is, a 10-inch um, tablet. It costs absolutely a pittance, really. You want to target Windows, Mac OS, Intel, or ARM, and ARM? You can do that. iOS, of course. Android, of course. Even the web, from a single code base in a project, it's absolutely true. And see my other session where we talk about this competition where it says we uh, we use Delphi as a weapon in a real fight one. I show you exactly what happens with that and how I, uh, I targeted various things. This is what Delphi does. This is the strength of Delphi. But more importantly for enterprises, Delphi keeps on running even after the whole operating system has been upgraded. Install a load of patches, install a security advisory, do something else it's still going to keep working and it'll keep working without needing any new downloads or reconfiguration there are apps that were written to target windows xp and because they were written properly they just run on windows 11 today now obviously later versions of delphi start to rely on some features of the operating system so that's only true if you haven't used any of those new features from windows 10 uh, some of the cooler things like the elevation button won't work but, uh, but yes, you've got a, a, a continuous um, rock-solid app. And I like to show people how I can deliver a fully-fledged um, client-server application running on a USB thumb drive, zero installation. And it will talk to millions of uh, uh, records of data through a MySQL server. They just log in and it'll run off the thumb drive. You cannot do that with .NET. It is impossible. Uh, you can't really do it with um, Electron, for example. Flutter. All these apps need some support behind them, but Delphi apps don't. It's all built into the runtime, and off you go. Anyway, my name's Ian Barker, and I'm an Embarcadero Delphi MVP. The slides and links and replay will be available at tinyurl.com forward slash every app trick if you want to read more blogs by me on the main blog then go to blogs.imbarcadero.com forward slash author forward slash ian barker thanks for listening i'm back <laughs> and we've also got jim we get jim's going to give it a go and see if we've overcome the gremlins how are you doing jim yeah uh hopefully doing okay we'll see if i get any feedback on my audio or, or not feedback, yes. <laughs> or not feedback. Yes. Yeah. So, 
Um, I start some questions, um, lots of people asking questions, and then a big conversation about who used to remember, uh, who used um, monochrome monitors back in the 80s. I, I don't know. There's, there's some very uh, uh, long experienced developers, I think, in the audience. So there you go. Yeah, so, my experience um, is getting pretty long, too. So there's a question here about rich notifications. Yeah, we all. Yeah. So someone was asking about the notifications and saying, um, in the notification component, can you do rich notifications? And those are the type of the notifications where if you click on them, up, it expands and then it can play a video or some other rich content. And I believe the short answer is it can't be done with the Delphi T notification component, uh, unless you know otherwise, Jim. I don't. Not with the T notification component. I think but you can't do it. Yeah, you can't do it with the T notification component, I don't believe, but you can get down there and grab the APIs yourself and do that. Yeah, the reason that you can't do it is it actually, when they go to click on the notification, you get an event triggered, and the event allows you to then um, inject content into the notification area. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated, a bit, bit more um, difficult than just uh, preloading it with some text and stuff like that. Um, someone said, who was this last? Whoops. Oh, did I, show I clicked, I clicked it. Oops, you clicked both it clicked. Okay. Right. You, you can drive. Um, Lars said, uh, he relied on Charles to analyze the headers of a C sharp app to be able to replicate the OAuth 2 login in the Delphi HTTP client. Uh, okay, good. But that's why I showed some components. I think universally people are saying it's tricky and, uh, it's, it's not, it's not actually difficult to do it's difficult to get right and as someone says there it's a major pain in the, the butt to get right so yeah. uh, and i've had to do it a couple of times now but the components i showed um th there are a few around there ecgc -E, uh, the company name always confuses me but um their components if they've got like four levels of subscription and you had to get the absolutely top level in order to have the server component um, but they do do it. The client side was anything. And um, the TMS components do the OAuth stuff. The Sphinx uh, thing is very good. Um, don't Question do about NFC right. here. Yeah, they're talking about authentication. And um, actually, someone was a bit confused about biometrics and saying that biometrics allow people to spy on people. Um, let me just explain how biometrics works very briefly. Biometrics, they when you put your finger on a device, it doesn't take a photograph of your device, your finger. What it does is take some metrics, some measurements of what's known as minutiae. The same is kind of true of the face. And I think what they really meant was that biometric recognition, facial recognition um, from TV cameras and CCTV could help with spying. It's not the same as the biometrics on your device. That's stored in a secure enclave on your device and nobody can reverse engineer that out. And actually that's true of the um, biometric devices like the time clocks that the on the companies I work with does. You could get the uh, minutiae out and then be absolutely useless. Even if the government put a gun to your head and said you must uh, identify who this person is and try and recreate the fingerprint, they could not do it. It's impossible. So it's uh, no good whatsoever. There is, I mean, so, Technically, you know, there is a degree of trust between you and Android or Apple, right? So, yeah, you know, in theory, Apple or Google could be doing something more than that. But as far as the app itself, the only thing that you're really giving the app itself is that you verified your biometrics. And so that potentially removes your plausible deniability of saying, I didn't use the app because they well, your biometrics yeah. authenticated it. But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I don't really see it being being that big. Knowing who it is for sure, you know, saying it's definitely this person using the phone. If you then go off and kill someone, and you happen to have your phone in your pocket, and they triangulate your uh, your mast and all the rest of it, then yes, it probably is a bad idea. But to be honest, if uh, if you're worried about people spying on you, I'd be more worried about email. Um, your credit card records can be pulled and they can see what you've been buying and where you've been shopping. Your phone mask records are recorded. Yeah, really, they're a bigger fish to fry when it comes to um, someone spying on you. So uh, I would not worry too much about that. Yeah. Um, NFC. Yeah, someone asked about NFC and said, um, what does, uh, what, how does this work with NFC? Different technology. 
Um, the NFC is really a bit like a, a Bluetooth uh, on steroids, I suppose. And uh, the, it's not the same thing. So the biometric horse, um, component works with the biometric um, uh, hardware on your mobile device. And it is only iOS and Android. Whereas NFC is a completely different type of thing. You're, you're, you're asking for some information from uh, an F NFC reader and sending out information. It's not, it's not the same uh, technology. So no, they, the biometric horse component is got nothing to do with it. Uh, and people saying their eyes are incompatible with dark mode. Um, and I've said this before, and I, I just mentioned this. Uh, I know Lars is joking, but dark mode is, a, is a, an accessibility thing. And in Europe, you're legally required to uh, incorporate accessibility uh, functions in your um, applications, your websites. I personally have very bad um, prescription, as most people can see from my glasses. And because of that, your your eyes are elongated and it causes these floaters. Everybody familiar with what I mean with these floaters that float in front of your vision. And mine are quite bad. Uh, even though my eyesight's corrected well, the floaters float in front of me. If I don't use, if I use dark mode, I can't see them because the dark mode completely um, negates the effect of the floaters. If I use light mode, the bright lights and bright sunshine outside accentuate that, and it actually makes it very difficult for me to read the text, especially small text. So joking apart, dark mode actually, for some people, I know you might not like it or you might love it, but it's actually an accessibility feature for people that do have visual uh, problems. So uh, joking aside, yeah, you should be you should be looking at supporting dark and light mode if you can. Yeah, I was going to say, you, uh, um, styles are a cool thing to have multiple styles and there's some taste choices in there, but you should definitely have a, a dark mode, a light mode, and possibly, you know, some sort of high contrast more, you know, one that's got a good contrast to it if your other modes look, you know, are very stylized. Uh, for, from just from an accessibility point of view, because some people, yeah, they the Lars seriously, maybe he can't look at the dark screen. That's possible, right? Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not saying that. It, I'm not saying which way is it good or bad, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's not always because it's a cool thing. It's actually because there is a reason behind it. Yeah. And uh, and the final one, because we're, we're at time, I think really is um, Unigui is amazing. Yes, uh, Unigui and all the other web frameworks out there. Uh, you can write Delphi code and go out to the web. I think we've, I've said this multiple times. That's why I uh, covered it very briefly. But, um, yeah, it's it's a great thing. Delphi is a, a very vibrant language, and um, there's still a very active community of various components and things like that. So, you know, we'll learn more about that tomorrow, I think, in my other session. There's a lot coming. <laughs> Apparently, your audio is great, by the way, Jim, just FYI. Awesome. Yeah. I'm not sure what uh, it was wrong this morning, but I'm glad it's working now. You have angered the gods of technology yet again. 